Good evening. Uh, we have the privilege of opening up God's Word. Um, tonight we'll be looking at Esther chapter 9, um, starting at verse 18 and right the way through to chapter 10. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 14th, 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observe the 14th of the month of Ada as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and the morning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they'd begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamaditha, the Agite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, these days were called Purim from the word pur. Because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them would with, should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed at the end at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews nor should the memory of them die without among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abel, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning the Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Xerxes, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designated times, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. Chapter 10. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king had raised him, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of the Jews. This is God's word. Well, it's an unspeakable privilege to open God's Word. We have made it to the final section of uh, the book of Esther, and I hope it um, has been a blessing to you all. It's been such a... Um, God's really helped me and shown me a lot of things in my own study, and I think Magic Ian could probably say the same uh, for himself. So here we are. We find ourselves in the last section. Um, so before we jump into it, I know it was already prayed, but um, can I invite you please to call... Uh, on the name of the Lord uh, with me so we can ask for his blessing on this time. <clears throat> Our Father, we, we come before you and, and we want it to be a, a humble approach. We recognize that we have come to enter into your presence, not simply as individuals, but as the people of God. And this is our great privilege. We want to honour you and recognise your greatness at this time, to remember that you are the great I Am, that you are the mighty one, and we are 
like the grass. We wither and perish. We fade very quickly from view. And so, Lord, with that perspective, we pray, may you increase and may we decrease. And, Lord, we pray that you would uh, just open the heavens and pour out the Spirit, and we pray that you would again open our eyes and unveil Christ to us. Show us Christ. And we pray as your word is opened, that it would burn in our hearts such a warmth, everything that is needed for life and godliness, and to bring you more worship, may you bring about this evening, we pray. And Lord, we want to see your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we jump into the text, I just want to read a verse, a verse for you in the New Testament. I think you probably know it well. James chapter 4, verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if, the Lord, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this and do that. Now, we know the verse well, and as I was thinking about uh, this final chapter of the book of Esther, um, if there's anything that we've seen in it, it has been that the plans of men, the workings of men, the things that we look forward to, God can completely turn it around in the matter of a moment. He can change the course of history in the sleepless night of a king. And this is the nature of how God works. And so this is, as we wrap up the book of Esther, it is a reminder to the pessimist to think that things may be crumbling in, in your life, that God can turn things around so quickly. And he's shown us that in this book. But it's also a reminder and a caution to those who are overconfident and to think that they have their steps established and that they are paving the way forward. It's a reminder that God can turn around things in a moment. And so James cautions us, in light of the book of Esther, be careful what you say, what will happen tomorrow or next year, rather, if the Lord wills. And I think it's an apt summary of the book. The Lord will turn things around. And so really, that's, that's part of the title of the sermon uh, this evening. But I want us to consider a few things uh, in this text, uh, Esther chapter 9, of, of things that the Lord turned the tables around with. So firstly tonight, if you're taking notes, tables turned around. The first point is mourners become those who rejoice. Mourners become those who rejoice. Now, as we jump in chapter 9, verse 20, Mordecai is re, uh, reintroduced and Mordecai re-enters the scene. But before we see what he does and why he's here... We must just bring it back to the forefront of our minds, Mordecai's appearance, and it's, it's quite significant, his, his appearance at this time. What does he look like in this scene as he emerges onto the text? Well, we've got to go back to Esther chapter 8, verse 15. So have a look at Mordecai, Mordecai, uh, Mordecai in verse 15 of chapter 8. Mordecai left the king's presence wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. So this man who was, that we read at the beginning of the book, who had his clothes torn in misery, who covered himself with the rough clothes of sackcloth and took the fire ashes and poured them all over his head and went through the cities crying and weeping. He is now dressed in glory, in splendor. He is robed in splendor. So Mordecai re-enters the scene this man of splendor. And what's he doing? Look at verse 20. What's he doing? Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far. What's he been doing since he's received this new position? He's been writing and he's been recording the events that have taken place. He's jotting them down, documenting them, right? Kind of like the disciple Luke, who went on missionary travels with Paul, to spread the gospel. And as they went, Luke was writing, and he was writing down. And then 
after recording all of these things, what do we get? We get the book of Acts. Or kind of like the Apostle John, who walked with Christ, and he wrote down afterwards the things that he saw, the marvelous works of God, that God was walking amongst men. And then what did we get from those recorded events? We get the Gospel of John. Well, Mordecai, in these letters, what do we get? We get the Gospel according to Mordecai, recording the events of God's great salvation. And so he records them, Haman's plot, God's invisible work, and God giving Israel the victory. It's all recorded, and it's published far and wide. It goes everywhere. But what else does he do? Does he write to the people? Well, he doesn't just record the events, but he calls for a response. Here's what has happened, and the follow-up letter is a call to response. Look at verse 21. So he wrote to them to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. So what is the response that he's calling for the Jews? What, 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 how should they respond to these events? The call is for celebration. The call is to celebrate here. It was just uh, a couple of months ago that we went with my family. Uh, we went with a friend to the Sydney Kings uh, basketball grand final. Uh, at Kudos Bank. And anyway, the Sydney Kings won the match. Uh, they took the lead in the final minutes. The siren went. The victory, victory was secured. The crowd went crazy. And then the MC on the mic afterwards, after the victory had been won, he said, guys, I want you all to know in the stands, the night isn't over yet. The night has just begun. We're all going to stay back because it's time to celebrate. So I want to see everyone in the foyer of the stadium to party and celebrate with the Sydney Kings. The victory had been won. But the victory called for a response, celebration. And we must understand that celebrating victory, that's God's idea. That comes from God. Because what happens when God leads Israel through the Red Sea, he brings them through it. And while the sea is still parted, the Egyptians go in. God closes the seas upon the Egyptians. The victory is finally won after all those plagues that he sent. What happens immediately after that? Exodus 15. Moses leads the congregation in a song of praise. All of them. Celebration, because the victory has been won. And so this is why we, we sing at church, right? It's not just a mere formality. We come together and we sing because we are celebrating the victory that God has won. We praise His name. We rejoice because he's won the victory, and it deserves celebration. But notice just how significantly God has turned the tables around. It says there, if you have a look in verse 20, 22, I believe it is, verse 22. They need to celebrate it as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies... And as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration, he wrote to them to observe the days of days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Look how significant God turned things around. They went from having threats against them in every city to relief and rest from their enemies. And they went from fasting at the beginning of the book to now feasting. A big change, but it gets bigger than that. It goes deeper than just the external celebration because it says they go from sorrow, their sorrow is turned into joy, from mourning into rejoicing, a day of celebration. And we've seen how distressed they were. We've seen how distraught the Jews have been. They have been crushed when the news was sent out that they would be wiped out. And why did God allow it to happen? He brought them to the lowest of lows so that they would look up, look up to God. He brought them to the lowest of lows so they could be raised to the heights with God and joy with Him, rejoicing with Him. Christian, is it not the same for us? Does not Jesus reaffirm and promise us the same thing? What does he say? 
Blessed are those who mourn. He said, hold on a second. Wait, Jesus. How can people who are in mourning, how can they be the blessed ones? But what does he do in that verse? He turns the tables around. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are the ones who will be comforted. They're the ones that are going to have comfort in the end. And he assures us of this. And so let me ask you, Christian, are you distressed? Are things going on in your life where you're troubled? Where you're weighed down, where you feel a bit crushed? Where you feel overwhelmed? And where you feel defeated? Well, just look at this case. It seemed hopeless to the Jews, their situation, didn't it? Everything seemed absolutely Hopeless, but God is the one who can turn the tables around. And mark my words, Christian, he will turn your mourning into rejoicing. That's what we see with the Jews here. He did it. So that's our first point. The mourning will be rejoicing. Secondly tonight, the tables are turned around. The strong are made weak. If you're taking notes, the strong are made weak. Now, because the biblical author is wrapping up the book of Esther here, we're coming to the conclusion. Another character is reintroduced into the story. Haman is brought back into the scene. He was killed months ago. But he's brought back in here. Look at verses 23 to 24. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast a purr for their ruin and destruction. Now, do you notice the li- it's, it's little detail, yet it's a weighty phrase that's attached to Haman's title there. What, what does it say? Haman, the enemy of all the Jews. Not just the enemy of Mordecai, the enemy of all of God's people, all of the Jews. He is the prototype antichrist here on the scene. Haman was one man that opposed, he threatened to kill 750,000 Jews. That's how much roughly would have been around at the time in the Persian Empire. One man stood against 750,000 to wipe them out. This is one strong man. One powerful man, one dangerous man. But friends, look what God did to the strong man. What did he do to the strong man? Look at verse 25. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Did you see the turning the tables around language there, the evil scheme that he plotted was to be brought back upon his own head. A complete reversal here. So we saw he builds the gallows for Mordecai and he's hung upon them. His plan is to wipe out the Jews, to wipe them all out. And what happens? He and his descendants are completely wiped out. He and his sons were hung upon the gallows. A complete reversal. See, Haman dug a pit and he fell in it. He set a trap and he was caught in it. He was a killer and he was killed. The Lord turned the tables. And there's one other thing here that the Holy Spirit includes and he wants to remind us about Haman here. One more detail. It's seemingly small in the description. But look in verse 24. How does he describe Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite? Now, the Spirit emphasizes here that he was an Agagite. Now, that is, he's a descendant of the Amalekite king Agag. The Spirit wants to put that detail there. Why does he do that? Well, he's drawing our attention back to 1 Samuel 15, all the way back to Israel's first king, King Saul. And God told King Saul, kill all of the Amalekites, that wicked people, slaughter all of them, leave no survivors. And what does King Saul do? He kills everyone, keeps the spoils, but he keeps alive King Agag. He keeps him alive. And when the prophet Samuel 
hears about this. He's absolutely furious. He rebukes King Saul. He picks up a sword and he hacks King Agag into pieces, it says. And then it says, the Lord rejected Saul as king. That's the context there. Now, why does the Holy Spirit draw our attention all the way back to that event in 1 Samuel 15? Why? Because what King Saul failed to do, Queen Esther made sure of doing. Mordecai made sure of doing. He, King Saul failed to kill Agag. Esther ensures that not only Haman is killed, but all of his sons are wiped out. Agag is only now a distant memory because his descendant, Haman, is killed and his sons. So where it says there in verse 25, he and his sons were hanged on gallows, it's just incredibly significant. Now let me just quickly remind you what Haman said in chapter 5. And this is why the author brings it back here in verse 25. So just go back with me quickly to Esther chapter 5, verse 10. Because the author's recapping here. Esther chapter 5, verse 10. Look at the second half of the verse there. Now, Haman calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife. Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she invited me along with the king tomorrow. So what happens now when we move to Esther chapter 9, when we get the recap? Haman has boasted of his wealth, of his sons, and his status. And what does God do? God takes every single one of those things from him and even his own life. Takes all of it away. What do we see? The strong are made weak. The strong are made weak in a moment. Now think about this. What an an encouragement the book of Esther would have been to Jews throughout history. What an encouragement through their persecutions. It is said that during the Holocaust, that the Jews were smuggling in copies of the book of Esther into the Nazi prison camps. You can understand why. What an encouragement to see what God is able to do and how God is able to turn things around in a moment. And it says that even many of the Jews in those Nazi concentration camps, they had the entire book of Esther memorized. It's incredible, isn't it? But think about how the book of Esther would have blessed. What an encouragement it would have been to Christians in the first century. Because things were the other way around in the first century for Christians. Those who persecuted Christians the most in the first century were the Jews. Were the Jews. And yet they had the book of Esther to encourage them about how God treated his people. And Jesus... He, in Revelation, writes to the churches to encourage them in their persecution. Let me read to you what Jesus says to the heavily persecuted church in Philadelphia. This is what he says to them. Revelation 3, 9, to the church in Philadelphia, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. Here's a reversal language. I will make them come down and bow before you, falling at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Is that not identical to what happened to the Jews in the book of Esther? Those who hate you and persecute you, Jesus says, I will make them come and bow down before you and acknowledge that I have loved you. So this is a reminder here to persecuted Christians that God will ensure that their enemies will fall. And this, friends, is a reminder to those who are wicked and ungodly that God will surely bring them to ruin. The strong will be made weak. The tables will be turned. Well, that's our second point. Thirdly tonight, the tables are turned around. The unreached will be reached. 
the unreached will be reached. Now, Mordecai recorded these remarkable events and he wrote that they should be celebrated. Now we get into the detail of what the celebration, what this feast, what it should be called. So look at verse 26. Therefore, these days were called Purim from the word Pur, because of everything written in this letter and because of what they'd seen and what had happened to them. So the feast and celebration is to be called Purim. And why is that? Because it comes from the word Pur. And if you go back to verse 24, what did Haman do? When he plotted to destroy them, he cast the Pur, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. Now, the poor, P-U-R, it's a weird word. Um, It's literally just a singular word for a die that is rolled. A singular die that is cast to give an answer. Now, why did he cast this lot? Why did Haman cast the lot? Well, in ancient times, they believed that to get the wisdom, to get the guidance of the pagan gods, you would cast the lot and the outcome would be the God's will. So Haman had planned to kill the Jews, but what he wanted was he wanted their blessing upon his plan for execution. So he cast the lot thinking, I'm consulting you. You give me the day. Whatever the answer is, you give me the day and you give the blessing to my mission. So this is what he does here. Now what is interesting is, that throughout Israel's history, they also would cast lots to determine the will of God for certain things. So you remember, for those of you who are part of us in, in our series in the, in the book of Joshua, when Israel finally gets into the, into the promised land, chapter 18, Joshua's like, okay, we've got the land, now which tribe goes where? So Joshua says, I'm going to go into the presence of the Lord, and I'm going to cast lots, and I'm going to tell you where you're going to go. Even more interesting than that, when we get to the New Testament, at the beginning of the book of Acts, Peter says to all the disciples, hey brothers, Jesus chose 12 of us, 12 disciples, 12 apostles, to represent the new 12 tribes of Israel, as it were. But friends, remember, one of us betrayed Christ. One of us is dead. Judas has hung himself. Now we need to find his replacement. We need someone who walked with us, who saw Christ, and who's going to bear witness to the resurrection with us. Who's it going to be? They come up with two names, Joseph and Matthias. How do they come to their decision? Peter prays, casts lots. But God, through all of that, He wants to continually remind his people not to fall into superstition or not to turn the the lots or the die into some kind of idol. What does he say in Proverbs 16, verse 33? The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. He's the one that determines. The number doesn't really matter on the dice. The outcome is what the Lord wants. So what's the point of mentioning all of that? Giving that little context. The Jews look at these events, they remember God's sovereignty, they recognize God's sovereignty, and because Haman cast the pearl, they decide to use that name as a celebration of God's victory. What was meant for their destruction, they take that word and turn it into the title to celebrate God's salvation. It's in honor of the Lord. Now, the Jews at Purim, they sang many songs, and we know some of the songs that they sing. They're recorded for us. I want to just quote one paragraph from one of the songs that they sang, and it highlights the double meaning of Purim. Let me quote it to you. It says this, Haman rose through his wealth and fell through his wickedness. Upon the gallows he built himself was hanged. And here it is. All the world was struck with amazement when Haman's purr became our purim. Do you see where they get the name from? And purim is still celebrated today amongst the Jews. But what's helpful to note is in the first, book, first five books of, of the Bible, there's about five to seven feasts that the Lord gives his people. About seven feasts. All of them are commanded by God. Purim was, was, in, uh, was established 
by God's people, not God. And the author wants to go to great lengths to tell us this. Look at verse 26 and verse 27. Look what he says. So because of everything written in this letter and because of what they'd seen and what had happened to them, verse 27, look at the language. The Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. So it says they took it upon themselves to establish this feast. So hold on a second. If this, if this feast didn't come from God, wasn't commanded by God, if they set up, does that mean it's wrong? I mean, is that kind of unbiblical? He didn't command this. Well, it's not wrong because it's about what God had done. It's a celebration of what God had done and the events that he brought about. And as you look at this, does the practice of Purim, does it sound familiar to anything that we practice as you look at the details here? Does it remind you of anything? Look at verse 22. That second half there. He wrote to them to observe the days of feasting and joy and giving of presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. And then when you get down to verse 27, it was to be observed every year. So you have an annual celebration, giving gifts, having a lot of food, celebrating God's salvation. Does it sound like anything we've established? Does it sound like December 25? where we come together, we celebrate God's salvation, and we give gifts to each other because we've received the greatest gift from God's hand, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is what they do here. And now we're told the purpose of why they are to celebrate it annually. Look at the purpose. Why is it to be an annual celebration? Look at verse 28. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, and in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never cease to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of them die out amongst their descendants. What is it? Every generation is to come and participate in this. And the memory of what God has done is never to die out, never ever to fade from view. The Jews were going to be wiped out. They were going to be crushed. Their names were going to be forgotten. Their children and their children's children would never have come to know Yahweh. But God turned it all around. And God saved them. He turned the tables around and the unreached became reached. And it was to be celebrated every year. So God does all of this. What, what, and, and they now set up this annual celebration. Why? So that the next generation will praise the God of their parents. It is to be every year, every year, from all people, so that they will call upon his name and praise the God of their parents. Now, how will God ensure that the next generation, how will he do this? Ensure that the next generation calls upon the name of the Lord, that the memory of his salvation will never be wiped out. What will he do? What will this feast need to have? How will it need to happen? Look what he says. Verse 28, it is to be observed in every generation, and here it is, by every family. Do you see that? How is it to be passed on to every generation when every family is celebrating the salvation of God? We need to understand this. You know, we live in such a time where Christianity, it's so individualistic. You know, we have, you know, put on a plaque and engraved, make sure you have your quiet time, your personal time, just whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes, your Christianity hangs upon that. Just make sure you have your quiet time, whether it's in the car, wherever you are, by yourself, just have that time with the Lord. That's absolutely vital and it's absolutely important. But what does God's word show us? His salvation, His wonderful works, the praise of His name, the reading of His word, the prayers offered unto Him. It needs to be happening in every family. Every family. Each home. Husbands and wives. And if you have children, with your children. And when that happens, the next generation will know and the memory of God's salvation and His wondrous works will not be wiped out and will not die out. So we've seen tonight the mourners 
begin rejoicing. The strong are made weak, and the unreached will be reached. Lastly, the book of Esther closes showing that there are tables yet left to be turned around. There are tables yet to be turned around. Now notice again, as the book is wrapping up, Esther now is reintroduced into the story. Esther is brought back into the scene. Look what it says about her, verses 29 to 32. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 promised provinces of the kingdom of Xerxes. Words of goodwill and assurance to establish these days of Purim at their designated times. As Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. And 32, Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. Now, it's quite remarkable that Esther has risen to such authority. Mordecai, who's second in charge now, he's written that these things are to be done. But what does it say? Esther follows up with a letter confirming that this is to happen. She has, in a sense, the final say here, confirming her authority. This is remarkable, especially for a woman. Think back how little authority Queen Esther had prior to all of this. She couldn't even enter the king's presence without risking her head being cut off. And now, with such authority, she confirms these decrees. It's incredible. And yet, something more remarkable is said about Esther in these words. Remember, the Holy Spirit is wrapping up the book here. And now, we look back at what's been one of the most repeated themes regarding Esther. What have we seen over and over again? What's been the repeated theme? Her identity. Who is this woman? At the start, she's called Hadassah. She's just a Jewish orphan. Then a chapter later, she's made queen, and she's named Esther after the goddess, the pagan goddess of love. She's given a pagan name, and she keeps her Jewish identity secret for five years. But then in order to save her people, to save the Jews, she needs to announce that she is a Jew. And now when we get to the end of the book, how does the Holy Spirit describe her? What does he call her? Look what it says there in verse 29. So Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail. She is the Persian queen, but she is a Jew. She is a Jew and everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. Her true identity is shown. And so that's Esther. And now we come to the postscript of the book. Chapter 10, these few verses here. And it's significant. Look at verses 10, 1 to 3. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. In all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king had raised him, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king, kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of the Jews. Now, again, next characters reintroduced to wrap up the book. Xerxes comes back onto the scene. And you look at what it says about Xerxes and it's so awkward. I mean, you look at it and you're like, why is that even there? What, 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 what's his scene? What does it say about him? King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. So King Xerxes set up taxes for everyone across the land. I mean, what, seriously, what is with that? What, what, what's that about? How does that fit in? I mean, how is that good news for the people, right? This is everything's about celebrations. Here's celebration that hardly fits the theme of celebrating. Higher taxes, yay. Who's going to throw up their hands and celebrate that? And, and that's what it says. Why is this detail recorded here? What, why does it say that? What, what, why are these assigning words of the king, signing off words of the king? Well, it's hard to be certain. I've been scratching my head about it. But it seems to be to highlight an important reality here. Esther has changed. Mordecai has changed. The king hasn't changed one bit. He's the same king through and through. He hasn't changed one bit. Yes, celebrate. 
And so this is a reminder here for the Jews. Yes, celebrate the victory, but it still requires a right perspective, doesn't it? Celebrate what has happened, but do not get carried away and forget about where you are still living. You are still living in the Persian Empire, and it's still the same king on the throne. Yes, they escaped physical death. Celebrate. You're alive. But do not get carried away. Remember where you are. You're not in the promised land, and Messiah is still yet to come. Yes, you've been spared physical death, but your greatest need is being spared of the second death. The lake of fire. The Messiah is yet to arrive. And this little wording here on the king is just a reminder of where the Israelites still live. Let me quote one author. He writes this. These words invite us to go back and reconsider the extent of the reversal that has happened for the Jews. Yes, the Jews have received rest from their enemies all around. All except for one enemy, King Xerxes himself. End quote. It's just a reminder. Don't forget who Xerxes is. He took all those young virgins from their homes, brought them into his palace, slept with all of them so he could decide which one would be the best queen for himself. He was so callous, he just went along with Haman's plan to just completely annihilate an entire people and race. And he was so indifferent, he didn't believe that they needed rest from their enemies. So he gave the signet ring to Haman. It's this king, as long as he is rich, as long as his harem is full of women whenever he wants, it's fine. This is the king that's still in charge. This is the king that's still on the throne. And here's the point. Evil was not truly eradicated yet, and God's people didn't have complete rest yet. They didn't. But the the book's postscript doesn't end with Xerxes. Look who jumps back in. Verse 3, Mordecai the Jew. And you see all those wonderful words about him. I won't read it again. It doesn't, the book doesn't close with Esther, but surprisingly it closes with Mordecai. The one that was persecuted now is in the glorified position and the one who was at the bottom is raised to preeminence. But there's something even more wonderful here in this conclusion. And look carefully at the very last words of the book of Esther. Look very carefully at the wording. What did, what did Mordecai do? He worked for the good of his people and he spoke up for the welfare of all of the Jews. Now that word there's really, really important. It says in our English translation, he spoke up for the welfare of the Jews. That word welfare there is the Hebrew word shalom. For their peace, for their wholeness, for their completeness that comes from God, that rich word shalom. He spoke up for their peace. So he works for their good, and he spoke up for their shalom, that they would receive that. He's the prince who comes to bring peace to God's people. And the book of Esther ends with those words. It ends with those words. But here's the problem. This prince who brings peace to the Jews, he dies soon. He dies like the rest of mankind. And the problem is, as you read on in the Bible, the people of God, they go wayward again. You just read the next parts of your Bible. They go wayward again. And what happens? They lose and forfeit the shalom of God all over again. The peace, they lose it. They stray from him. And so the book of Esther alone, if you just take the book of Esther alone, it is insufficient. It is insufficient. Because what do we learn from it? We see in here wickedness punished, but not fully. We see in this book God's people rescued, but not permanently. And we see in here God's people given rest from their enemies, but not completely. We see two Jews rise to the throne, but not permanently. This is how the book ends. It closes this book. It ends and it leaves us waiting for something more. It leaves us yearning. It leaves us looking for relief, looking for deliverance, looking for something more permanent. When sickness and suffering and death, when it's all going to be eradicated, someone, a prince who will bring peace but permanently... How's God going to do that? And the book of Esther just closes. It just finishes here. How is God to do it? 
How is he to bring in this everlasting shalom for his people? You have to keep reading in your Bible. The book of Esther is not the finish. In Esther's day, how did God do it? He brought shalom through bloodshed. He killed the enemies of the Jews. He killed them. But like Esther's day, God would bring about peace again through bloodshed, but this time not through the blood of the enemies of God, but through the blood of his own son. The blood of his own son. Jesus would lay himself upon the altar of God and God would slay his only son in our place and Christ would die a criminal's death. And worse than that, he would die as a sin offering. A sin offering. Your filthy sins my disgusting sins upon him. And he'd be laid upon the altar of God. What do we read in this chapter? Haman, that wicked man and his evil sons, they're hanging on wooden posts. What do we read in the future? How does God bring peace? He lays his beloved son on a wooden post and he slays him. He slays him. And becomes the altar of God. And for six long, excruciating hours, God lays upon the sin, of, the sin of his people upon his own son and pours out his judgment upon his son, upon the wooden posts. See, everlasting peace that God would finally bring, it came to great cost to God. At a great cost to God. So let me tell you, if you get to the, book of, the end of the book of Esther, as we have, if you get to the end of the book without yearning, without longing, without crying out for Calvary, you've missed the point. You've missed it. And you've missed the reason why this book sits here in our Bibles, the book of Esther. You miss its position and you miss its purpose. It's to lead us to Christ. So what is the fitting response then? to the book of Esther. What is it? As we close up, what's the fitting response? Friends, it's celebration. It's celebration. Let the praises rise up to God. Let the people rejoice. Let the people sing. Let them gather together with merry hearts unto the Lord. Why? Because the grave cannot hold us and hell will not touch us. And we will live with him forevermore because the Prince of Peace has come and he's brought in everlasting peace. Friends, as we close the book of Esther, Jesus Christ himself becomes our Purim celebration. He himself is our peace, everlasting peace. Sin, sickness, sorrow and death will all be eradicated because of Christ. He died he was buried, he was raised, and he ascended to the right hand of God. And friends, the final turning of the tables around will be when the rejected Messiah is in glory and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And friends, the tables will be turned around. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we thank you for the greatness of your salvation. I pray that we would be a people of rejoicing, a people who celebrate because we've received the grace of God, that peace has come and that we have life everlasting with you. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Esther. We thank you for the time in history that we live, that there's been more written after the book of Esther, and that we have recorded the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the coming back of Christ, and we have prophecy of what will happen in the eternal state. So, Lord, we thank you for these things, and we thank you, uh, for all that you show us in your word, and we thank you for your son. And Lord, now it's our joy to respond to you with singing and praise. In your son's name, amen. Let's sing.